Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Ephrata Community Church viewing online today. My name is Wes, and this is Jim. We both have the privilege of serving as part of the pastoral team here at Ephrata Community Church. And thank you. Thank you for taking some time to tune in with us today. Man, we are so excited for today's service. Uh, this weekend is what we call Vision Weekend. But what really kind of capsulizes all this, Jim, is we have baptism this weekend. That's a good one. That's makes and me how happy. many was it as last count? Do you know? Yeah, well, I think I saw 48. I think a COVID hit one family. There's 45 people being baptized. And I want to remind you, last time yeah. we did this, uh, we had 21 people spontaneously baptized. Yeah. And we're not holding that as like some high watermark right. as much as saying, we're so thrilled right. to see what the Spirit's doing in the hearts of people. Amen. It really, really gets us pumped. It really is. And you know, one of the things we're so excited here about here at Ephraim Community Church is we pray for encounters every weekend. And today is just kind of fruit of that, the, the evidence of Absolutely. God encountering people and people taking a step and okay. following Jesus, people taking a step and recommitting their life to the Lord through baptism. So what you're going to see today through baptism and even the words that Kevin will share is just an evidence of the fruit of the spirit of God at work here at Ephraim Community Church. And so we're excited, not for only what God's doing in the lives of the 40-some being baptized, we're excited for what he's doing in your life. And That's we're right. praying for you, and we're so thankful for you tuning in with us today. That's so we're right. excited. We have Vision Weekend. That's what this worship guide is, Vision Weekend, as Kevin's going to also, after the baptism, share a little bit uh, of kind of a message for the year. We're mm -hmm. excited about what God has to yeah, definitely. share he's, today. He's pretty amped up, this message. We heard it last night. I just want to add something to what I said, I was talking to my mom this week who watches us from York County. Hi, mom. Um, I always like to do that shout out. But I just want to, I was reminding her, she goes, Jimmy, how many how many people actually tune in? You notice yeah. that Jimmy I threw in there? Right, but I got that. She's one of like three people who are allowed to call me that. Jimmy, so be many? careful. Be careful, Wesley. But all that to say, she just said like, how many people like me are like, and I'm like, man, we had 370, we call yeah. them unique devices. That means there might yep. be four of you sitting behind that television or TV screen or computer at home. But all that to say, yeah. we really really do view you as a community. Absolutely. You are specifically prayed for. We don't know the reason you might not be able to be with us on campus. You need to know something. We're cool with that. We know yeah. that the Spirit's ability to reach across everything yep. possible. There is no Holy Spirit only constrained to one spot. Uh, absolutely. And so we are believing for God to do things in your life. Maybe it was something that happened through last weekend services. Kevin's going to remind us again, reinforcing this theme of taking one step. This yep. is the time of year when we launch so many of our different activities and programming mm -hmm. that reach to you. We have just shy of 50 connect groups across three counties. <laughs> awesome. And we just want you to know, like, get onto our website. Yes. Go to Take One Step. At the top, you'll see connect groups. Just yeah. see where people are at. We actually launched a affinity groups this year too. That means infinity. Affinity, buddy. Listen closely. <laughs> so all that to say affinity groups mean it's not just about where you live right. or whether you're discussing the sermon. Right. It might be something you love to do like bike riding or motorcycle riding. Actually go check that kind of yeah. stuff out. It's another way to relate to people, right? We had over 700 people. Now just so you know, wow. on an average weekend, we have between you and the people who attend, you're close to 2,000 people. 700 yep. of them signed yep. up last semester to be yep. a part of something. That's what we call taking one step. We want to believe that for you, even though you might feel like you're so far away. We have some online stuff you can take part of, things like ICL. And they, we also have some more intense programs, discipleship programs, if you're at that stage around Embark and things like that. Check out what we got going on and try to engage yep. at some level. Yeah, Absolutely. And if you just even would like to learn more about Effort Community Church, we have Connections Pathway. It's this Saturday. It's here at the building. It's in the morning. We provide breakfast at 8.30. A uh, couple, about four sessions that we go through telling you about the vision, the values, the history, uh, the history right. of African why, Community why Church. Why the stream of the church at, we represent. Right. Absolutely. And how you, God's made you to make a difference and how to get connected here at African Community Church. So you can go to our website. You can sign up for that. Let us know you're coming so we have enough food and hospitality yeah, for you. Breakfast. And we look forward to that as well. So that's next Saturday morning. Yeah. Uh, but today we're getting ready for the service. That's right. Right. And just one last thing about Connection oh, yeah. We used to do it over four weekends where you stayed for an hour after church. Yeah. This intensive is such a great way to come and check us out. And pastors will be there. You can ask us questions about Absolutely. who we are and what we're about. Even if you're just checking us out, you're not even signing yeah. on some dotted line for anything bigger than that. That is cool. That's but right. we also want to get to know you in ways like that Connect card. Right yep. below the screen, if you're
you're watching us yeah, online, on I'll that. remind you, you can watch us on our website, you can watch us on Facebook, you can also watch us on YouTube. But under, particularly under our website, you'll see a Connect card. Fill it out and let us pray for you. Yep. And let us know. Let us give us a testimony how God's at work. Every Tuesday, we as a staff pray through those prayer requests. So thank you for taking time to stay connected. Now, grab your Bible and grab your cup of coffee That's and let's great. worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth today. Yeah. Good to have you with us. Great to see you. was a really cool word of knowledge that came this morning about joy being released in the house this morning. Uh, a a uh, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and, and balloons being released that just fell over the auditorium. So I'm super excited about that. So let's just worship together in joy this morning. I just invite you to stand. Father, we just we fix our gaze on you. We turn our face towards you, Jesus. You are so good and you are so worthy of all of our praise.
us our hope and strength. You made a way. You made a way to unlock these chains here in your presence. Strongholds break. Freed by the love you gave. And we give you the high for you.
nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yeah, Father, we would admit that as we just sing the truth about the wonderful name of Jesus, it's hard to have any words. So, God, I'm going to choose the words that you've already written from Philippians 2, which speaks of Jesus Christ who though he was in the very form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, 
and being born in the likeness of mankind and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, to your glory, we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord. We confess him as Lord over effort of community church. We proclaim him as Lord over our region, over our state, over our nation. And Lord, even as it says here in Philippians chapter 2, you are Lord over all. You are Lord over all in heaven and earth and under the earth. God, everything bows the knee to our Lord and Savior. God, we would confess that while we use words to speak and try to communicate that which is upon our heart, we realize that the truth that we communicate is beyond anything that we can speak beyond any kind of words. We just simply yield ourselves to you. We declare you as Lord of all, and we honor you as such. You are the name that's above every name. God, I, I acknowledge the prophetic word spoken over this house that says that we would be known for a place where the authority of the name of Jesus Christ would dwell. And we would simply say yes and amen to that. Let your name be known in this place. Let your name be known in this region. Let your name be known in the state. May it be known in the world and the nation. Let it start here right here with us, God. And we would just simply say, may this place be known not for the names of those that pastor this congregation, not for the names of those who attend or are part of this congregation, not for the names of those that lead worship, but for the name of Jesus Christ, that one name would be exalted in this place. And that's the name that is already exalted, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We give ourselves to you, Father. Acknowledging the glory of your name. In Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you. I know it's kind of hard to go on from a moment like that, but I want to invite you to go ahead and take your seats. Children, if you would just kind of hang with us for a couple of minutes, we actually want you to be part of uh, this next part of our service. This is normally when we would dismiss you to your uh, children's ministry, but just kind of hang with us here, if you would, for just a moment. And since the kids are with us right now, I want to just take a moment and I want to acknowledge, I think it's third grade, fourth grade, and fifth graders. There's a portion of them that actually work together to form what is called the Junior Bible Quizzing Team. So yesterday, their season came to a close with a tournament that was up in Lebanon Friday night and Saturday. Uh, I think we had two teams that went and uh, those teams did very well. One of the teams ended up in a three-way tie for first place and uh, ended up kind of losing that match. So they ended up in third place, but did very, very well. Another team ended up in seventh place. Both did very, very well. As I was talking to a few of them before the service and last evening, they acknowledged, they were like, yeah, but they were fifth graders. Like, they were veterans to the whole thing, the budget of Bible quizzing. Like, we're coming back with a full starting lineup next year, and next year's tournament's going to look different. And anyhow, so it's... Ultimately, it's not about winning, it's about storing up the Word of God uh, in their hearts. And so very grateful for uh, the students that are a part of that, grateful for the parents, because it's actually a pretty significant time commitment, and especially um, grateful for the coaches, uh, because if they wouldn't be doing it, it just wouldn't be happening. So if you're a junior Bible quizzer in the room, if you're a coach in the room, just go ahead and stand, please. And if you're a junior Bible quizzer, you need to stand on the chair so we can see you. I give you permission to do that just this one time. All right, thank them for what they do. <clears throat> well,
Well, we truly have a celebration weekend. I think every weekend's a celebration, just some are, more, we, some are a little bit more so than others. But this weekend, we're celebrating baptism. And we have 48 people that are being baptized. We started yesterday afternoon, last night, of course, this morning. And then we're going to be baptizing this afternoon as well. And so we have 48 so far, which means that there's probably some people in the room that will be joining us in baptism this afternoon. And we'll get to that in just a moment as well. And I know that when we, we baptize, uh, let me just simply say this. I feel like there's a very significant grace on baptism in this season that we are in. And I know uh, in many places and for a long time it was taught that baptism is simply a, a public demonstration of your faith in Jesus Christ, your confession of Jesus Christ. And yes, it is, but it's far more than that. And there's a grace that extends to you when you act in obedience through baptism. And it's a little bit hard to explain. We call it a sacrament, which is actually something that God has given us in the natural by which he, he, he uh, extends his grace to us. That's things like the Lord's Supper, baptism, even something like an ordination. Like when someone was ordained, like there's a special grace that is set upon them for the task that's in front of them. And baptism is like that as well. And over the course of the past couple of years, uh, we've, we've you know, been revisiting baptism a lot. I would encourage you, uh, a lot of us in this room grew up in a religious system, and I don't mean that in any kind of negative way, but, you know, it could have been a very good religious system, but basically you got baptized because it was the thing to do at a certain stage of life, when ultimately the Bible says that you get baptized not because someone else decides for you, not because you just simply ought to, not just simply because you feel pressured to, but because you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've not been baptized in water subsequent to your confession of Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to take that step. And this weekend, 48 people are actually making that step uh, to, be, to, to, I know, to do that. And I know that when we do baptism, uh, we oftentimes have a lot of guests in the house that are here with friends and family, which I'm grateful for because the Christian life is meant to be lived with others. And so you need, we need to do this together in community. And, but also for that sake, I'm just going to share a couple things about baptism here at Effort Community Church. Uh, one is that we do practice baptism by immersion. That's what you're going to see happening here today. Uh, four people will be getting baptized in this service. Uh, we do practice what we would call believer's baptism, which is kind of what I just explained, that based upon your confession of faith, based upon your decision to follow Jesus, and based upon your initiative, you uh, give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. And then the third thing I would just simply mention about baptism is that it truly is a celebration because we believe that all of heaven is rejoicing over the significance of transformed lives. And if heaven is rejoicing, then we ought to as well. So they're already in advance rejoicing along with that. So when, uh, when someone you know is being baptized, a friend, family member, I want to encourage you just come to the front. Just come on, get out of your seat. Not now. I mean, yeah. But when someone's being baptized, like come, let's gather around them, let's be with them, um, because that's a very significant part of baptism. And then for all of us, man, when they come out, out of the water, I mean, what you're going to hear, we'll announce their name. Uh, as they're getting into the tank, you'll hear a bit of their testimony. And man, they are substantial. And we'll, we'll ask for the confession of faith. We'll baptize in them. And as they come up out of the water, come on, man, cheer them on. Cheer them on. Open up your mouth. Taking a big breath and let it out. All right? I am not a cheerleader. Never thought I was a cheerleader. Never kind of put myself in that category. Never want to put myself in that category. But I'm just simply saying, like, I can coax you along if I have to, all right? But I don't think I have to. I think you want to celebrate. Hey, a couple more things about baptism for this weekend. As we were thinking about this weekend and planning for it, uh, in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, is one of the places that records the baptism of Jesus. And if you've read that or other accounts, he goes into the water, John the Baptist is there, uh, he, he's baptized, and as he's coming up out of the water, it says that heaven is torn open, the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove, and God speaks from heaven and says this, you are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Don't get hung up on the whole sonship thing, that just simply speaks about an heir, it's not male, female, it's not gender specific, it's for a child of God. And I felt like one of the things God was saying uh, leading into this weekend, to speak to those that are being baptized. God just wants you to know he's pleased with you. And he's pleased with the step that you're taking today. 
And even as we were praying going into the weekend, someone came back with a prophetic word uh, about baptism this weekend and felt like there's some people being baptized this weekend that um, some enemies have been pursuing you. I'm talking about spiritual enemies. Some things have been hounding you. And the illustration comes out of the Exodus from the story in the Old Testament in which God leads the people out of slavery through the Red Sea, and they walk through the Red Sea, but God uses the waters as a way of eliminating those enemies that are pursuing them. And the prophetic word was that there are some people being baptized this weekend that God is going to use this water to eliminate the enemies that have been pursuing you. And as you come up out of those waters of baptism, some of those things, yeah, some of those things that have been pursuing you will be eliminated. You know, Jesus was baptized, as I mentioned, and you wonder why, because John said it's a baptism of repentance for forgiveness, of which he needed neither. So why did he do that? And he was baptized to identify with us. He identified with our humanity. And then for us, in our baptism, we identify with his divinity. From Romans chapter 6, beginning verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that our, the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. I want to go ahead and invite those that are being baptized to come up here to the front. And uh, as they're doing that, I want to share with them and all of us that um, I'm going to be leading them in a confession. And they're going to be repeating after me because we actually believe that what comes out of our mouth and what we confess is actually very, very significant. And so uh, I'm going to ask them to make this confession after me. And as a way of standing with them as the body of Christ, I'm asking that all of us make that confession with them, just simply as a way of standing with them. Then again, as I mentioned, you'll hear their testimony as they're getting into the water, and I'll ask them um, for their, conf their personal confession of faith upon baptism as well. So in order to participate and for your active involvement, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please. And I'm going to ask you and all of you to repeat after me as we pray. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come here today to publicly declare that Jesus is my Lord. I take his death as payment for my sin. And I declare by faith that when Jesus died, I died to myself. I renounce my old life of sin, the kingdom of Satan, all of his powers, and my own selfish way of living. May all that belong to my former life stay under the water. From now on, I want your will to be done in my life, and I declare by faith that when Jesus was resurrected, I too was given a new life. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. All things are made new. I ask you now for your power to live a life that pleases you. May I be a witness to you in all that I do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. My name is Roxy Acosta, and my testimony to our Heavenly Father began back when I was just seven years old. I had always wanted to be baptized. I've known Jesus Christ as my Savior all my life, and a few years ago, I lost my connection. I cut him off. As soon as I lost my connection with God, I lost myself. 
I tried to fill that void with drugs and alcohol. I got into a horrible relationship, which left me with nothing but needing the Lord. Especially as I am now a new mother to a beautiful baby girl, I want to raise her to know Jesus. The Lord has been calling me for years, and now he is all I crave. I'm proud to say that I have rededicated my life to Christ Jesus, and that name alone brings fire into my spirit. I was hesitant to be baptized because I believed I was not ready. The truth is that I never will be. So I'm taking this step in faith so that I can proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life and he rules my heart. To God I say, I am ready. Tell us who Jesus Christ is to you. There's many things that come to my mind when I think of that name, but salvation, deliverance, that's who he is to me. And on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm Ian Zimmerman, and I'm nine years old. I asked Jesus to come live in my heart during bedtime prayers with my parents when I was seven. I've been thinking about getting baptized for a little while, but last Sunday during worship, I had a vision of Jesus and me on the beach, and he baptized me in the ocean. I knew that was a sign that it was time for me to get baptized. I am so excited to take this step to show everyone that I love Jesus and I want to follow him every day. <clears throat> Tell us who Jesus Christ is to you. My Lord and Savior. Yep. And on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Maddie Miller. Although I have been a believer for years, I have never been baptized by immersion. I am choosing to be baptized in order to take a step fully into faith. It has been on my heart for a long time to be baptized, but I was afraid to take one step. A couple weeks ago, God encouraged me through various words of knowledge to take one step and watch to see the fruitfulness that comes from the simple act of baptism. I want to be baptized because I want to publicly declare Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am choosing to be baptized today as an act to show God my commitment and love to him. And tell us who Jesus Christ is to you. Prince of Peace and Lord of Lords. And on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm Jeremiah Kennel. Last spring, I went on the North Bay retreat, and one night while we were worshiping, I felt the Holy Spirit for the first time. I immediately felt like I should get baptized. Another time during worship, God spoke to me and gave me a song in Scripture to share with someone. In the past month, my relationship with God has been growing so much. I participated in the 21-day media fast and did a 30-day shred reading the Bible in 30 days. During the fast, I asked God for the gift of tongues. I decided one night that I would not leave my room till I spoke in tongues. As I was praying, God told me that he wanted to give me a heart of flesh like the Israelites in Ezekiel 36, 26. Right after I put my hands out to receive it, I started speaking in tongues. I am so thankful for what God has done in my life so far, and I can't wait to see what he has in store for me in the future. Yep. Amen. Yep. Tell us who Jesus Christ is to you. The Prince of Peace. Yep. And on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
I want to ask you to stand, if you would, just extend your hands this direction, man. We just want to agree together with the Lord for what he's doing today. God, I'm overwhelmed by the testimonies that I've heard, the work that you're doing, the, all that you're accomplishing, and we just simply come into alignment, and we join our faith with theirs and with the work that you're doing in your life. We say yes and amen. We thank you, Father, for the words that have been spoken, even over this baptism specifically, that the Lord would just simply say, you would say over them that you are pleased with their step. You're pleased with them. There's a voice from heaven that I'm just simply echoing that says, these are my beloved children in whom I am well pleased. We recognize as well that some have had enemies pursuing them. And those enemies, just like that illustration from the Red Sea in the Exodus, that the waters were used as a tool to eliminate the enemies. We speak over them that those enemies have been eliminated in Jesus' name. We bless them with the work of the Holy Spirit, God. You empower them to live the life that you've called them to live and to do everything that you've called them to do. We declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, but they shall fulfill all the plans and purposes that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. As you guys take your seats, we can dismiss our kids uh, to their, uh, the, the services for this weekend. Man, that is just so much fun. I don't know about you, but it's not a good idea to put the guy who cries all the time following these baptism testimonies. Um, I love the part when, you know, who is Jesus Christ to you? And then they, they profess that specific thing. Last night I heard for the first time that Jesus Christ can be your superhero. Um, it's official. Um, so that was beautiful. But uh, yeah, anyway, this is so much fun. Um, and then we have, what, 18 plus coming up this afternoon at 12. So as Kevin mentioned, uh, if you're here and you feel the Lord is, is stirring that within you uh, to get baptized, I have great news. We will be baptizing more people this afternoon. And uh, you have plenty of time to go home, get a change of clothes, and come back. Um, or uh, you could just say, forget that. I'm getting in the water, and that's what we did last time. It was a whole lot of fun. Jim even said he's going to get in with his plain clothes again because it was so much fun. Right, Jim? Something like that. Um, no, but I, I do want to encourage you uh, that if, if you're here this morning, you're saying, I have to get baptized, man, we will make place for you here today. We'll celebrate with you, and we'll make it happen. So, um, yeah, anyway, this is really exciting. At this time, I do want to uh, just have you turn your attention to the screen behind me. We have some video announcements that will play for you, and every single week we have a testimony video that plays, uh, but you will not see one on the video screen today because we have 48 of them being spoken out this whole weekend with their testimony, so we're hearing a lot of them. Uh, that's our testimonies for the week. Uh, but we do have some welcome video announcements, and afterwards, Pastor Kevin is going to come and bring the message this morning. Here at ECC, it is our desire to connect you with God and others. And here are a few simple ways we can do that. If this is your first time visiting with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here. In the seat back pocket in front of you, you'll find a connect card. Let us know that you are joining us today and how we can be praying for you this week. You can take that connect card to our welcome center where you can receive a gift. We hope you enjoy your time at ECC. Connect cards aren't just for first time guests. We want to hear from everyone. We encourage you to fill out one in person or online each time you're with us so we can better pray for you, celebrate with you, and provide care and connection. You can drop a Connect card in one of the giving kiosks as you leave the auditorium. We provide multiple opportunities for you to give. Envelopes are available in the seat pocket in front of you and can be dropped in any of the designated boxes as you leave the auditorium. You can also give online through the ECC app or by texting your amount to 84321. Want to stay informed on the happenings and events at Everett Community Church? Sign up to receive our weekly e-news. With so many exciting things happening throughout the year, we want you to be informed about all of them. Simply let us know on the Connect card that you want to receive our e-news, which is sent out every Thursday. Wow, that is great. Actually, I just want to invite you, uh, by the way, we are baptizing at noontime, which you know, you've already heard that, but... Honestly, if you want to hang around a little bit and just see 18 more baptisms this afternoon, I want you, <laughs> I want you to feel free. Like, uh, I feel privileged to be a part of all 48 plus of all of those. I feel bad for you for missing out on a few. 
So I'm just inviting you in to, to hear those awesome testimonies. It actually is amazing to be up here and, you know, be right with them when they're hearing those testimonies and just actually just sense the grace of the Lord right around and just what's being spoken. Man, what an awesome thing. I'm looking for the day when we never, like there's always water because we're always baptizing. I think that's where one of the places that God's taken us. And uh, it's going to happen. Hey, uh, I want to say a special thank you to both Matt and Jim for both the message last weekend as well as doing such a great job of just managing the service. You know, we plan for our services, but then we kind of hold it loosely to discern what God's doing in the moment. And uh, they did a fantastic job of that, that, both with encouraging you to take the next step in your life with the Lord, as well as just being alert to what God is doing in the room. Uh, I just thank you to Matt, thank you to Jim for, for doing that. Uh, I was in Orlando, Florida last Sunday. And I know when I say that, when you live in Pennsylvania, like there's a little bit like, there's a certain, certain amount of jealousy comes out because you were in Orlando. I'm just simply telling you, like, I'm not, I'm not a Florida person. Like, I like Pennsylvania. I like Pennsylvania weather and I like Pennsylvania wintertime. Matter of fact, I think this rain that we had should have all been snow. Like, if, it, if I was actually doing that, I think we need at least one close down everything snowstorm once a year in Pennsylvania. And uh, we, were not, we, were in, we were in Florida, not for the sake of a vacation, but we were there for a family wedding. Our nephew and his fiance and now wife uh, both work for Disney, so they live right there in Orlando. So we were just out Friday, flew down to uh, Orlando. Uh, there was family that was gathering from around the country, so some folks that we had not seen actually for a number of years. And so Saturday, we were able to spend some time together as a family, which has been a long time since we've been able to do that. Sunday afternoon was the wedding. Uh, and then came Monday, because while you were here and it was snowing or cold something up here, it was cold there too, by the way, so uh, while it was cold up here and like Philadelphia and New York and Boston, all that was closed down because their airports were being snowed in, like when you're not traveling, that's just kind of a blip on the radar, like, okay, I noticed that they said that. But when you're trying to get home from a warm place to a cold place, that makes all the difference in the world. So flights coming out of Orlando on Saturday were canceled. Flights coming out of Orlando on Sunday were canceled, which wouldn't make any difference for me like we're leaving Monday morning, except for the fact that everybody was camping in the airport for like two days. So we show up for a flight first thing on Monday morning with the intention of actually getting back here, like being back here in this area by like 11 o'clock in the morning. Man, it was planned. And we get there, and we even, like, we checked in in advance before you get into the airport. We could print out, you know, go up to the kiosk, print out your own baggage tag, put it on. Like, we skipped several lines. And then there was a 90-minute security line. Like, it went through all the queues that they could all possibly be set up. And then it went down two long corridors and wrapped around all the way. And so even with all of that, we just missed our flight. <laughs> Thank you for feeling my pain. I appreciate that. <laughs> but it was just one of those things like, like we pulled into the tram. I told Stephanie, I said, see, there's the plane, uh, number 56. It's still in place. Let's get down there. But they had closed the doors. Then, of course, what happens is you get put on a wait list. You're on standby for the next flight. So we were on standby for the next flight. They put your name up there. Like, we'll see who doesn't make this flight, and then you get on it. And apparently the security line was getting quick, quicker because... Every, most everybody got on that. So we were like number 17 on the standby list. And then, so we missed that flight. And then we came to the next flight, and our name didn't go up as much as what it should have. And so I asked, like, how comes we're not getting pushed to the top? And they simply said, because we have priority flyers, which kind of implies, and, and you're not one of them. <clears throat> so ladies and gentlemen, five flights and I had this promissory note in my hand that while I know it's now worthless, I'm clinging to. It's called a boarding pass. Like, I paid for a flight, I'm getting out of here somehow. So you go run through all this thing in your mind, I think, if we had just started driving yesterday when the wedding was over, we'd have been home by now. Like, you know, all those kind of stuff. And so you kind of make those decisions about, can we just rent a car? And then you kind of imagine what the rental car places look like, and everybody's doing the same thing. We are, people are camping out, people are angry. Like, I wonder, like... That guy's going to get security killed on them. It's just only a matter of time. This is not going to go well. Five flights. We ended up actually getting on a flight the following morning. 
uh, about 24 hours after our original flight was. And so we finally got on. Did you ever have that? In, I don't know if you ever had to wait that long for a flight and you just keep getting pushed like through five airplanes and not getting on. We finally got on one. And so you have all this anticipation like, okay, I'm on an airplane. I don't care if we just sit here, but I'm just, I'm on an airplane. That's just, that's a step in the right direction. Even if the airplane drives to Pennsylvania, at least we're moving <laughs> someplace, like we're getting someplace where we need to go. And so we're on the plane, <clears throat> we go out to the runway, and I experienced something I never experienced before. So we're off, you know, down the runway. We're about that place, you know, I've flown enough. I'm not this frequent flyer, obviously. Uh, but we've, I've flown enough that you know when the momentum is about there where it's about to lift off. And so just in that moment, slammed on the brakes. And I don't mean like slammed on the brakes. I mean I actually slammed on the brakes. It was an aborted takeoff. And so you heard everything, like up in the compartments, everything just slammed to the front. And I don't generally like put the seat, like I obey by putting the seatbelt on. I just don't put it on real tight. I think from now on I'm going to put it on pretty tight. At least till we get through that. Because it was such a slam. Like I could not, like you go into the seat in front of you and I could not push myself like the momentum was. You could actually not push yourself back to where you belong. And so they'd bring this airplane to a screeching halt. And I, I wasn't sure if it actually screeched or not, but it felt like it was, should have. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering, like, was there a plane coming in or was there a plane crossing in front? Like, what was going on? It was silent. Like, the guy said nothing. Like, come on, man, let us in on the secret here a little bit. And so here, here they ended up that um, the computer did some sort of, I don't know if it glitched or something, but it basically the computer read a system and said abort takeoff at the last moment. And that's what he, he just slammed, actually he just slammed on the brakes. And so after about three or four minutes, he gets on the intercom and says, hey, I'm sorry about the scare, which I, I actually appreciated the fact that he acknowledged that it was a scare. It wasn't just me. Because you ever been in a plane where there's like all the kind of turbulence and they're like, oh, it's a piece of cake, don't worry about it. And actually, it wasn't a piece of cake. That was actually pretty bad. You know, so when the pilot actually acknowledges like that was scary, thank you, appreciate that. I mean, that's at least a score right there. And then he simply said, hey, the computer alerted us to a default and, and you know, said a you know, board takeoff, and we're going to reset the computer and see if we can take off. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, like, I'm not sure if the whole reboot, like, I'm just going to push this button and see if it works. I'm not sure <laughs> that applies in this situation. But it did, and they did, and we took off, and we're here. So I don't know. That's, it just seemed like a little bit simple. But here we are, you know, it's one of those things, like, I had this promise that was a boarding class that's going to get me on a plane that's going to get me to Pennsylvania, and I needed to wait 24 hours for that to become reality, for that, for that promise to be manifested and actually get on an airplane and get to Pennsylvania and get home. Can you imagine waiting, like, 40 years for a promise to manifest? Can you wait, can you imagine, like, waiting a long time? And what it's like, like, just sitting on that airplane, like, the, even the second takeoff, like, okay, we're, are we actually going this time, or what's going to happen? Like, it's, it can almost be surreal to be in a place where you're finally seeing happen what you expected to happen all along. And that was only waiting 24 hours. And what would happen if, if you were waiting, like, 40 years or even longer? And so today, I'm only going to be focusing on about 11 words of Scripture, but that 11 words of Scripture comes to a place where there's a culmination of 1,400 years of waiting. And the entire story consumes about 199 chapters of Scripture, which begins with a promise in Genesis chapter 12. And it finally comes to a place of culmination in Joshua chapter 24. And it's, it's the story of God's promise to Abram whose name eventually would be changed to Abraham. And he speaks to him and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. Like by you and through you, Abraham, Abram, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And here we are today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a result of that word spoken, that promise spoken to Abraham so many years ago. Because when God said all the peoples of the earth will be blessed, he was speaking to Abram that he would become Abraham. He would be a father of a nation. It would be a group of people. It would be the people of God that God would call out to demonstrate to the world who he was. And it was through these people, the people of Israelites, Israel, that God would send his Savior by which all of us can be saved. Like when he says all the world will be blessed through you, he had no idea 
of how substantial that is. But here we are. And I don't even, we've not seen the fulfillment of that word even to this very day. That was Genesis chapter 2. As you know the story, he says, Abram, leave your home, leave what you're comfortable with, go out, go to the place I'm going to tell you to go. He goes to the land in Canaan, makes a promise, I'm going to give your people this land. Years later, there's a famine in the land, even as the, the family, Abraham's family is growing, he has a son, he has, his son has two sons, his, one of the two sons has 12 sons, and the family is growing, but there's a famine in the land of Canaan. Meanwhile, over in Egypt, there is a place where there's food, and so the entire clan goes to Egypt, and they're living there for a period of time at Harmony until the people of Egypt are intimidated by the Israelites, and so their answer to that is to enslave them. And the Israelites are in slavery for 400 years, 400 years. God calls out Moses, asks him to go, hey, you're going to be the person who's going to lead my people out of slavery and into the promises that I've made for them, into the fulfillment of those promises. And so Moses goes back and he is successful. The people are responsive and he leads them out of slavery in Egypt. But when it comes to that critical time, when it comes to that critical place where they're about to enter into all the promises of God, they don't have the faith to actually take that step and to take action on the promises of God. And so they simply refuse. They refuse to enter the promises of God. And so God makes this declaration over them. Because you refuse that, then you're going to stay and you're going you're to actually die wandering in the wilderness. And I'm going to raise up a next generation that will believe me and will follow me and will go to that place. And so here they had the opportunity of stepping into the promises but didn't do, do that. So they wandered for 40 years while the next generation come up. So can you imagine being part of that next generation where you've waited so long for the fulfillment of those promises? Can you imagine being one of the last people alive of the previous generation? Because you know everybody just wants you dead. Like, if you're like one of the last five, like, old oh man, like, as soon as you're out of here, we're heading in, so watch your step. Just telling you. Like, we can, we can expedite the promises of God just by getting rid of you. So, <clears throat> you'd be glad you weren't one of those. But it comes to this place in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. This is actually in your message notes there as well. This is the word. All that waiting, all that waiting, all that waiting. And he says this. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate is a religious word. You know, we don't use that in everyday language. It just simply means have yourself set aside for the purposes of God. Like, keep yourself for God and his ways. It just, that's, it's for him. It's for him only. So don't overthink even that word. But just to be set aside for the purposes of God. If you've been a part of Effort of Community Church, you know a little bit of our pattern. We begin the year with three weeks of season of prayer and fasting. We give that time to you to seek the Lord and what he has for you. We finish up that time with a prophetic week weekend. Of course, we did a seminar, Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. And then all of our groups begin. They're beginning right now, the internship at Embark and the Institute of Christian Learning, growth groups, connect groups. In other words, through that time that you set aside to seek the Lord, we expect you to know, okay, what's the next step that I take in my Christian life? So all that's happening right now. But one of the things that I do in this season of life, in this season of the year, is I, I ask the Lord, like, God, what do you have uh, we call this Vision Sunday. So it's not necessarily Vision Sunday in like, here's 10 things that we're going to do this year. But it's more like, okay, prophetically, what's God calling us into? Or what are some of the themes for this year that we may see kind of as we navigate through this year? And so a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting right here in the front row. And actually, Matt had the message that weekend. And I felt like the Lord said to my spirit, he said, it's go time. It's go time. It's time, you know, when you're in the airport and finally like, okay, you're, you're heading out. And, and here in Joshua chapter 3 verse 5, after waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled for so many years, that Joshua makes a statement like, now's the time, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And that's the season that we are in. We're going someplace. Each one of us is going someplace individually. Each one of us is going someplace as a family. We're going someplace as a congregation. The kingdom of God is advancing regardless of what anybody tells you. The kingdom of God is advancing upon the earth, and it's actually go time. And so 
from the time over the course of the past couple of weeks, as I felt like God spoke that to me, I've been looking and you know, asking him about certain times in the Bible in which he said he told someone to go and that he would highlight to us for today. And so I have four of these. They're in your message notes as well. And so I'd encourage you to follow along and go through them rather quickly. But I want you to have them because I think it's actually very important. So I'm going, first of all, back to Genesis chapter 12. And the first handful of verses there, you'll find them in there. I'm going to go through a lot of scripture. You can read them later this week if you'd like to do that. But Genesis chapter 12, beginning verse 1, is where God came to Abram and he made a covenant with him. And he simply says, I want you to leave your people and I want you to go to a place that I will show you. And the way Hebrews says that, as, as Abram made the hall of faith, we call that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, that Abram was willing to go out not knowing where he was going. And so when you think about Abram and what he had, like while he maybe lacked some things and there were some things that he was looking for, he was in a place of status and he was in a place of health and he was in a place of comfort. He was a place of wealth, right? not health. I mean, probably healthy as well, but I meant to say wealth. But he was in this place where he was comfortable and God called him out of his place of comfort to go to a place that he did not know and that God would show him. You know, I feel like the pandemic that we've been through, COVID-19, over the course of the past couple years, and I know all of you know this, there's been a couple things about that have actually changed the way that we think. Like there's things about it that have changed the very fundamental nature of who we are as a people and things that were not necessarily as high a priority as what they were before March of 2020 now have become like the things that actually control us. Comfort is one of them. Safety is one of them. I was talking to someone yesterday over breakfast, and we were talking about work and so forth, and he, he works in an office in which since March of 2020, the office has never regathered in the same location. He's got team members that he's never seen personally face-to-face. -face. They've been hired since then. They work. It's all remote. And like, well, why don't you ever come back to the office? And is that ever going to be? He says, well, um, yeah, I'm ready. He says, but some people just aren't comfortable. Don't think of, like, since when does comfort control since when is being comfortable such a controlling factor in the way that we live our lives? Can I just simply tell you something? As a follower of Jesus Christ, you will never grow in comfort, period. Never. If you look back over your life and you think about times of, of growth, like spiritual growth, I can guarantee you pretty much 100% of the time it's happened during times of stress. Because it's during times of stress that we press in and we reach and we dig deep. Matter of fact, not only just simply in your spiritual life, but basically any kind of life, any kind of area of life, when you want to grow, it's actually good to put you in a position of yourself where you're not completely overwhelmed, but you're just kind of out of your comfort zone where you need to grow in order to stay up with what's happening, right? So you want to get in shape? It's not going to happen being comfortable on the couch. You're going to need to sign up for a gym or you're going to need to sign up for some sort of program. You're just going to need to come into a place where it's going to hurt a little bit, right? But yet we've, we've magnified this area of comfort and then we use it as a way of simply saying, well, I'm just not comfortable. Who cares if you're comfortable or not? I mean, frankly, that's not what it's all about. And you're going to grow spiritually. If you want to grow spiritually, it's going to be intentionally stepping into a place of discomfort. Like, well, I've never you know, taking a growth group on parenting before. And I don't know if I can commit or do that. Or I've never sat in a connect group where I, I allow people to kind of get close to me. Or I've never gone to a, a growth group or, or signed up for the Institute of Christian Learning or the Embark Internship. Or I've, I've never done something like that. And I'm not sure I'm quite comfortable. I might be stretched. Well, that's, friend, that's actually where you're going to go. That's where you're going to grow. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. That's a Randy Clark statement. At least, I'm not sure if you got it from someplace else, but that's something that you hear him regularly say. Faith is spelt risk. Like there's a place of actually stepping to a place where you have, okay, I have enough evidence that I can take a step, but you still have to step. And you'll notice there in your message notes, I refer back to the Exodus story, which I'm talking about today. Exodus chapter 3. If you've been part of our, our uh, Connections Pathway, uh, you've heard me talk about this as well. So what holds us back? If we know that God has something for us in the promises, if we simply take that step, think of the Exodus story. 
When they walked through the Red Sea, they walked through on dry ground. God blew a wind all night long and dried up the sea, pushed back the sea, dried up. It's almost like he rolled out the red carpet. Like, here, walk across the Red Sea in this way. But when it came time, coming out of slavery, he made it easy. But when it came time for them to enter into the promises of God and they were to walk across the Jordan River, the Jordan River was at flood stage. And he says, the water's not moving. This is the Kevin Eshelman paraphrase. The water's not moving until you step into it. In other words, the water kept going and going and going. And you step into the water and you read the account. And it says, when they stepped into the water, the waters stopped at a dumb, which is five miles upstream. How long does it take for five miles of flood stage water to pass through the priests that are standing in the middle of the river? They said, the water's not, like God said, like you're going to step or you're going to see that water sitting there. It's just going to stay. Like there's areas of your life that you have got to take the step. It's actually spelt risk. It's not spelt production or, or presumption. It's spelt risk. So I have Exodus chapter 3 in there. It's where God's calling Moses uh, to be his leader, to lead his people out of Israel. And Moses is in a very comfortable position. He's married. He's got a couple kids. His father-in-law, Jethro, is his boss. And he's in the back desert, doesn't need to deal with too much. And he's a happy camper. And then he's out there and he sees this bush that has a fire. It's actually not a burning bush. You've got to read the scripture account for what it is. It's a bush that has a fire. But the bush is not on fire because it's not being consumed. And so Moses looks around and says, oh, that's odd. I'm going to go over and check this thing out. And so Moses walks up to the bush that's got a fire inside of it. The fire is residing, but the bush is not being burned up. So you think, was the bush even green? And it wasn't even wilting the leaves? And so he's observing, that's strange. What the world is going on here? And the fire speaks to him. And one strange thing is that he actually speaks back. Like, I would kind of look around like, where did that come from? And who's, you know, sun, been in the sun too long. I need to drink water or something. But Moses speaks back to the he says, take your sandals off, you're standing on holy ground, I'm going to send you back, and you're going to be my leader. And Moses, in their message notes, there's four things that he says. Who am I? It's four lies, four common lies that the enemy speaks to us. And we have our insecurities, and we think, well, who am I to lead a connect group? Who am I to go on a mission trip? Who am I to do this? And who am I to do that? Who am I to step in and, and, and mentor someone? Who am I? Like, and so we have all these insecurities that prevent us from stepping into the promises that God has for us and stepping out of what is comfortable for us and actually being stretched in some way. And then Moses, secondly, after he gets through that argument, who, who am I? He says, but what if they? Like, in other words, he's concerned about what people will think about him. Like, what happens if, what happens if I actually get radical for the Lord? Like, what happens if I just say, like, this is truly, I'm just going to do this and I'm just going to go all in. Then what are people going to think? What's my family going to think? What are my coworkers? What are my old friends going to think about me? So we get worried about what others will concern, concern. And so it prevents us from actually stepping into what God has for us because we talk ourselves out of it. And then he says, but I've never, like, I'm not, I'm not, in his case, he says, I'm not articulate, I can't speak. In other words, we think that we have to do what we have to do based upon our own skill and ability. And so therefore, we think about our own insufficiencies, and so we don't take that step into what God has for us. And then finally, after he's basically losing the argument with God, he is, is uh, he says, well, just, hey, could you just send someone else? Because actually, I'm pretty comfortable here, and I don't want to go back there. Now, here's my point in actually bringing all that up. If Moses can say no to a bush that has a fire that is speaking to him, how easy is it for any of us to say no to an inner prompting of the Holy Spirit? And we do it all the time. Like as you went, you know, you talked about Jim's, I talked about Jim's message last week and you were sitting here in the midst of that under the anointing and you had this prompt that simply said, man, I need to get in that parenting class. Or, you know, I've been dealing with pornography, I need to get in the Conquer series. And it was a prompt and then you ignore that. Or you're in living in freedom every day and in, in that group or whatever that is or whatever's being off us, how, how to study. And so you have this prompt and we dismiss it. Anytime, friends, anytime it's a prompt that's going to help you grow in him, you've got to know that that's the Holy Spirit prompting you. You think, I was just my thought. No, it wasn't. Because you don't have those thoughts. 
In the natural flesh, you have none of those thoughts. And so every time that you have a prompt, I need to go to the Gateway House of Prayer. I need to sign up for the internship. I need to do the Institute of Christian Learning. I need to do this. Like, you have that kind of prompt. Please know, 100% of the time, that is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do not say no to that voice. Let him lead you and let him guide you directly into that. If, it's so, if Moses can actually say no to a bush that's got a fire that's speaking to him, how much, more we, how much easier it is for us even to say no to this inner prompting of the Holy Spirit. I feel like we do that all the time. Even as we say yes to him, and we're, it's in this place of go time, I'm looking at places in the scripture where he's told us to go. And I'm looking at Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus walks past Matthew sitting in his tax collector booth. And he says two words to him. It's so incredible as I read that account. He says two words to him, follow me. And man, I love the simplicity of Matthew's response. He gets up and follows now, we think he just kind of followed Jesus around. That's what follow me means. No, actually, to us, that's not what it meant to him. Matthew knew that when he gets up out of that tax collector booth and he goes after that rabbi and just asks him to follow him, it's all or nothing. Like, he's leaving all of this behind, and he's pursuing Jesus Christ with everything that he has. And it's a place for us to go. It's a place for us to be called into a place of wholehearted devotion before the Lord, a wholehearted step towards him. You know, friends, um, somehow in the American church, and I'm, we're, we're Americans, it could be broader than that, it could be the Western church, I don't know. But we've adopted this, this idea that we can look at Jesus and we can hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, he, was, he bled out for us. He shed his blood, even though he was completely perfect, he shed his blood so that we can actually be forgiven of sin and we can recognize that we are sinful human beings and we need his forgiveness and we can say, yes, Jesus, I want you to forgive my sin. I want you to save me. I want to be in with you in eternity. I want to be with you forever. And we can receive him as Savior, but not acknowledge him as Lord. And friends, I'm telling you that if that's the way that you think, you just need to know that's not in the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. Because what Scripture teaches is that he is both Savior and Lord. And I recognize that there's a place of growth and there's grace for growth. And he, he's forgiving and kind and he's, he's leading us on. And so we're all growing and understanding Christ's Lordship in us. But I'm just telling you, friends, if there's something in your heart that resists that says, I want to take salvation from Jesus Christ, but I'm going to live my own life the way I want to live my own life. Friend, I would actually challenge you to question your very own salvation. Because I'm not completely sure it's biblical. And what he wants for us is to be all in. He wants us to be wholeheartedly devoted to him. And he understands as we struggle with that. But to disregard the commands of the Lord, to disregard the directives of Jesus Christ and think that we're saved, uh, friends, I can't stand here as your pastor and say that that's, that's okay because it's not. And I realize that you know, we live kind of in a seeker-sensitive culture. And let me just simply tell you something about that. I am all in on being seeker-sensitive. I think God meets people right where they are and so do we. But then oftentimes, I feel like there's times when, for, uh, for me as a pastor, I feel like we're coaxing people. Hey, come close to Jesus. Come close. Just investigate this. And that's, and that's all okay. But there's a lot of people in this room, and there's a lot of people watching online, that you know enough for wholehearted commitment. It's time for you to go for it. It's time for you to step into it. It's time for you to quit playing games with Jesus and say, I'm all in. And here's the thing about that. Only you know that. Like, I can't judge externally whether someone is really looking to Jesus as Lord. Like, that's you. I can't do that. But right now, I'm stopping in this message right now. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Give the Holy Spirit 30 seconds to say, man, am I in? Am I in?
Thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you that you speak to each of us. And you direct us. God, you know. God, I pray, Father, for everybody here that we would just simply be honest with ourselves. And we'll be fully in to follow you. You know, in Joshua chapter 24, even these people that were raised even by like being hand-fed of the Lord, Joshua stands in front of them and says, listen, if you think that serving the gods of other people is worthwhile to you, go and serve them. Like if you want to serve the gods of the Amorites or somebody else, like if you think it's actually not worthwhile serving the God who brought you out of slavery, then go serve them. Like he says, don't waver between two opinions. Like figure out. That's where Joshua says, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And there comes these times where people like me need to stand in front of the people of the Lord and just simply say, listen, how long are you going to waver? Like how long is it going to be that you tolerate some of the values um, that are in our society and culture that are actually not biblical values? And we straddle the fence and we're in two places at the same time. And every now and then there needs to be a call to the body of Christ. Come on, man. Go all in. All in for the Lord. It's his way and it's only his way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. He is your Savior and your Lord. And I want to encourage you to do that. And actually, I'm just going to put this in there today. We are baptizing people this afternoon. And I'm going to be here. If you feel like, okay, I need to get all in and you need to make that, come on, don't. Don't, don't hold back on that, but step into that place. Going on to a couple other places where I've noticed that God said he told people it's go time. Matthew 28. Uh, I just want to mention these quickly. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 19. Go into all the world, uh, making disciples of all nations. And we, we, have a, we have a habit of compartmentalizing our lives. And we say, here's my work life, here's my church life, here's my devotional life, here's my family life, here's my recreational life. And we have all these boxes that we put life in. Uh, when it comes to the Lord, there's no boxes. He's just all of it. Like he's in all of that. And so he's part of our work life, he's part of our church life, he's part of our devotional life. And so some scholars would say, as you look at Matthew 28, they would say, as you go, like in the midst of all the life that you're living, it's not just about going to other countries, although it does say it is that. But as you go, all that life that you did, you do. You're making disciples of the people around you. So we embrace the Christian life as being all of the life that he gives us. And the final thing I want to mention, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. Friends, we are, we are living in a, such a unique time where it is possible in our generation that every person on the planet will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like we have the possibility of being the generation that can see that. And as we are here today in this place, there are still people in the world that have not heard. They don't even have the access. They don't have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in some places, they don't have access to the, even the word of God. And I would encourage you, like there's no excuse for us as, as in 2022 to be unaware of what's happening in the world and to be unaware of how the gospel is advancing in India, Myanmar, and you know, the Middle East and, and Russia and Ukraine and Egypt, whatever that is, like we can be a part of that. And I would encourage you, if God's not laid either a people or a purpose on your heart, to take it before the Lord in prayer and say, God, would you give me something? Would you give me something to carry? And so it could be a people... Like it might be a people group who hasn't heard the gospel and maybe you can participate in praying for them or even sending people there, supporting them financially, whatever that is. Or it could be a purpose like saying, uh, I, want, I want to be part of Bible translation and I want to see the Bible in every known language on the earth. And I'm going to put an effort, I'm going to put a prayer effort and a financial effort in seeing that behind. But, but we of any generation have the privilege of seeing the gospel go to the entire world. And we have no excuse for not participating in that. Friends, it's go time. It truly is go time. And I want to encourage you. Step out of those places that are comfort. Step into what God has for you. I want to encourage you to go all in. Go all in, wholehearted devotion to him. I want to encourage you to, as you go, make disciples, like recognizing that he's part of all of life. And then for us as a church, us as a people, and us as a church as a big C, like all of us, go into all the world. Be aware of what's happening around the world and participate in that. Let me give you, let me give you a little bit of a window into my, 
uh, personal devotional life. Like when I feel that God wants to do something in me or he wants me to really grab something and he's forming something new in me, there's a couple things that I'll do. One is I'll find a place in scripture where it speaks of that and then I'm, I memorize the scripture. And that's just simply so it's always with me. And when, if I'm driving someplace, I can think about it or recite it and just a way of just kind of constantly meditating on that. Matter of fact, I'll go as far as say 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. If you ever wonder like, hey, how can I pray for that guy? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 to 5, just pray that I'm a happy camper. All right? That's what, that's what I'm working. But then sometimes I'll actually get a song that I think speaks to the season that we are in. And I listen to it over and over and over and over again. Do you ever have like one of those, uh, like an advertising jingle gets stuck in your head? Do you, know, you don't need to be subject to those, but you can purposely stick something in the back of your head. Like you can do that on purpose. And so when you wake up in the morning, it's the first thing that you hear. It's the first thing that's running through your mind. It's just there in your subconscious. And so I use music to do that. And this song that we're gonna sing in closing, and it was the first song that we sang today, is the song that I'm using for that right now. And I listen to it over and over and over again. You begin to get a little bit tired of it and you think, I'm, I'm gonna impart this thing. I'm gonna infuse this thing in my brain and my heart uh, no matter what it takes. I'm just gonna sing it over, I do it over and over. So I, I, can, I can play it twice between where I live and here. So it's two times on the way to work, two times on the way to work, and there's times in the in, in work and it's at home and then it's like whenever. I'm, not, I'm like, because the words of the song I believe speak to the season that we are in. Because God made me some promises. And it won't stop now. And it's go time. And it's actually time for us to step in and inherit the promises that he has for us. And I'm gonna ask you to stand as we sing this song together. And I don't want to sing it like it's some sort of closing song. All right? I want us to sing like it's the declaration that we're making over 2022. And we're declaring this is the way it's going to be. And the Lord is saying to us, it's go time. And we are going to go. That we're going to consecrate ourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among us. And Lord Jesus, I just commit this year to you. And I thank you for what you're going to accomplish and we commit to agree together, to, to cooperate with you, to step out of that which is comfortable. We agree together, Lord, to commit ourselves wholeheartedly to you. And for those who have wandered away, we agree together to recommit and come in. And those who have never committed, man, man, a Christian life is such, you know, you think about what you're giving up to become a believer. You got to think about what you're getting. Because everything you're giving up, no matter what it is, pales in comparison to the good things that God wants to do in your life and through you. And I would encourage you today to say yes to Jesus. He'll forgive your sin. He'll come in. He'll set you free from things of the past. And he will give you a life that you cannot imagine. I would encourage you to make that decision this very day. Because God made us promises. And they won't stop now.
That's, can you clap for Jesus? Yes. In closing, um, I want to invite the prayer ministry teams to the front. And uh, Kevin, during the transition out of worship, would have mentioned uh, a promise spoken over ECC. I want to bring it up before I invite different people, uh, different words of knowledge, different prayer items to pray for. I want to start with this, um, that... Uh, the promise that we're holding on to here at ECC, uh, and if, if you are a member here, if you attend here, if this is your first time here, you've entered into an atmosphere that we are believing this promise here uh, in this house as well as in this region. Uh, and that would be that the move of God, what he's going to do, uh, will be known by the name of Jesus. The authority of the name of Jesus will manifest in such a way that it'll be classified, the work of God. People will observe it and say, the name of Jesus is known there. And, and that's been a promise on this house. It's a prayer item for us. Um, and John 17, 6, Jesus was praying to the Father, and he said to the Father, he said, I have manifested your name. And that's my prayer, is that the name of Jesus would manifest in this place. <clears throat> and with that, the first thing I want to invite people to the front for, we pray for anything that you'd want prayer for, but this is the invitation. Uh, one of them is that... Um, the name of Jesus would manifest in your life and that it would, the authority of that name would destroy every other name that's trying to take its place. So if you are dealing with a sickness in your body and you've been diagnosed with some type of n named illness, well, the name of Jesus has more authority over you than that named illness. And we are inviting you to say, you know what? I'm going to take a step in faith, not just you alone, but as a, as a culture as a community, we are together stepping in in faith saying, I am believing that the name of Jesus would manifest in my life. And it can be a sickness. It could be something that you've been born with, something you've had your whole life. It could be a relationship issue. It could be something your second grade teacher spoke over you. And since then, you've been walking around with this title that the name of Jesus needs to destroy. It needs to break it off of you. And so however that applies, I promise you, there is a name of Jesus that applies to you. He's healer. He's redeemer. He's the counselor. He's the one. He's the hope bringer. I feel like the, the word hopeless just came to mind. I'm telling you, there is hope in Jesus. And if you're carrying around the name of hopeless, you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm inviting you to the front to say, in this specific area, I'm trusting that my Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, will show up in my life. And that name will manifest in my life. And, and so that's the first invitation I want to give you. I have a couple other words of knowledge, which is to say that as a, 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 as a team and as uh, before every service, we pray and ask God, are there specific things that you want us to pray for and invite people to the front to receive prayer for? Is there anything specific? And I have a few of them. Uh, the first one, on the left side and the neck, there's a sharp pain, almost as if there were like four, three or four prongs just like piercing into the neck, really sharp pointed pain right here in the neck. If that is you, uh, it, and it's almost like if you can imagine a garden tool, uh, just like pressing in on your neck. If that's you, we want to pray for you. Also during worship, a gentleman came to the front and said, I'm just seeing, so it was a vision, I am seeing crooked spines made straight. And so if you're dealing with that, we want to take time to pray for you. And I'm telling you, there's nothing impossible for Jesus. And as I mention these things, if that goes off in your mind, you can tell the devil to go take a hike and you're gonna step out and believing that Jesus, the name of Jesus is more powerful than that stupid thought that's from the pit of hell. He can heal all things. Um, next thing is, and this is the, uh, the last thing, um, I had a picture of uh, a single mother uh, with a child uh, and, and the, uh, the name Othniel came to mind, which, is, which comes from scripture and I looked it up uh, and it means God's strength uh, or the Lion of God and, and I feel like there's a single mother here uh, that, um, that God is saying, I'm giving you my strength to endure, to press on, to navigate, to, to take that next step, to keep moving. And so if you're a single mom here and you just need God's strength to meet you, we want to pray for you as well. All right. <clears throat> One last thing. Uh, if you are here and you do not know Jesus, I'm telling you, 
he's someone you want to know. Um, and we got the tank here, and the, it's biblical. They believed, and they were baptized. And I'm telling you, man, it is going to be a good day for you. If you do not know Jesus, the way we introduce you to him is very simple. It's a series of yeses where it's, yes, I, I admit that I am a sinner and I have fallen away from the living God. And yes, I believe that Jesus is the son of God sent from the father, that he paid my punishment price. He paid my debt by hanging on a cross and dying. He became sin, 2 Corinthians 5 says, so that I could become the righteousness of God. Yes, I believe that. And yes, I believe that by the power of the Spirit, He was resurrected to new life. And I as well, by that same Holy Spirit power, am resurrected with Jesus into new life for all eternity. That's the gospel. That's what it takes to get saved. And if you have not done that yet, I want to pray with you. We have a team of people that will pray for you. Talk to your neighbor. And I don't care if you don't know him or not. You say, you need to pray for me. I need to give my life to Jesus. And if don't leave this place without doing that. Same thing goes for rededication. You're like, I'm telling you, there is no place. The blood of Jesus is stronger than your most shameful sin. I'm telling you, he'll meet you right where you are. All right. I think it's now a time to officially close our meeting because we will baptize people in 13 minutes from now. <sighs> yeah, or now is good to you. If you could just put your hand on your heart, I want to I want to declare this this scripture over us. And I ask you to put your hand on your heart just as a way of saying, Lord, let this let this be true in my life. I receive this for myself is what you're saying. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you in Jesus name. Amen. Be blessed as you go and we'll see you next week. We want you, Lord, like never before. And your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. I know breakthrough. I know breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle, my God made me a promise and he